Hey, in the next few weeks and months, we will be talking quite a lot about Eurofighter. One important thing to know, to really understand that aircraft, is how Delta Canard aerodynamic configurations do actually work, why they do exist, which are the advantages and the eventual disadvantages. This is something that we have already covered on the channel, three videos that I think are among my best, so I thought that it would be useful to have a long format video about the Delta Canard. Enjoy! When I was a child, maybe seven or six years old, my parents gave me a coloring book. Coloring book like this. And wow, it was my only game for weeks. I colored everything and I also had my mom cut out the planes and stick them on a mirror in my old room. I was watching the planes all the time and questions started to form in my young mind, so many that I didn't even have the words to express them. Finally, one day, I managed to formulate the most important question in my life so far. So I asked my dad, Daddy, why some planes have wings long and thin and others are like a triangle? Look, they're like arrows. Well, I didn't know the term delta wing at the time. My dad answered, I don't know what you're talking about, son. They all look the same to me. The universe crumbling into shards in that precise moment, and I'm still not sure it is back in one piece today. There and then, I learned that my dad didn't know everything. Here and now, you will learn why so many fighters today are designed with Delta Wings. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay till the end because the stuff that you learn here, you don't find anywhere else on YouTube. The origin of the Delta Wing go back to Germany in the late 30s, but it was in the 50s that engineers became really interested in the Delta Wing all around the world. It was 1952 and in France, Marcel Dassault was commissioned the first French supersonic operational plane. And the request from the French Air Force was clear. What they wanted, above anything else, was speed. Dassault at the time was developing the successful Mystère with swept-back wings which will enter service in 1954. So the first thought was to refine the Mystère, developing a new wing optimized for the supersonic flight. More sweep and a lower thickness to chord ratio was required, but after their calculations, they realized that the resulting wing would have been just 10 cm thick. A wing like that can be built, of course, but it will have no room for fuel, no room for the undercarriage, and it would be structurally very heavy because, yes, thin wings are heavier than thick wings, but, well, this is a different story. Obviously, Dassault was not a man to give up so easily. He stripped the mystery of its wing and he adopted a Delta plant for it. And it was love at first sight. The result was the Mirage I, the forefather of the Mirage fighter family. Various iterations followed suit and when the new fighter was pitched against the Etendard, the alternative being developed for the French Navy with a conventional wing, well, the French Air Force had no doubts. The Mirage was more difficult to fly, had a smaller payload, and landed at a scaring speed of 330 km per hour, requiring very, very long runways. But it was amazingly fast, easily reaching Mach 2 under the thrust of the new Snecma Tau turbojet. The Cold War was fought in the sky by three great warriors, the American F-4 Phantom, the Soviet MiG-21 and the French Mirage 3. And guess what? All three of them had a Delta platform wing. Something that is often overlooked is that not all the planes that have a wing shape like a delta actually have a delta wing. Wings produce lift because the pressure on the lower side is higher than the pressure above. This is true in general for delta and no delta wings. A 
conventional wing produces lift because its section is shaped like an aerofoil. This is a shape that forces the air to move faster on the upper side than the lower side, creating a suction, which is called lift. The aerofoil is probably the most important feature of the wing, defining much of its performance. Delta wings, however, are different. As one of my professors at university used to say, they do not have a leading edge, they only have a trailing edge all around. At very low angles of attack, the air flows in a way similar to a conventional wing, but at low alpha, the wing doesn't produce much lift. As soon as you start increasing the angle of attack, something strange and unique happens. Two vortices start to detach from the root of the wing along the wing forward edge and above the wing itself. The airflow gets separated, it creates two very quickly spinning regions of air. Since the core of the vortices is spinning very fast, it creates a low pressure region that sucks the wings upward, generating extra lift. The almost miraculous aspect is that the vortices are quite stable and the whole wing is stable as well. Pitch and roll. Understanding intuitively why it happens is not very easy. You may think that if the pressure on the lower surface is higher than the pressure above, the flow below the wing is deviated toward the wingtip. This is the phenomenon that generates the wingtip vortices that you can often see during the air shows. If the wing is swept back at angles of 50 degrees or above, you may imagine that the flow below the wing leaks on the upper surface before reaching the wingtip, causing the separation and the vortex formation that you find above delta wings. So proper delta wings have a thin leading edge that promotes the formation of the vortices even at relatively small angles of attack. Actually, a large part of the aerodynamic design of a proper delta is devoted to controlling the formation and the position of the vortices that in a real world situation do not detach directly from the root, but they will detach the intermediate point on the leading edge. Planes like the Rafale, the Gripen or the already mentioned Mirage 3 have a true delta wing. Planes like the Eurofighter, Typhoon or the A4 have a delta-like platform but the wing has a thickish airfall with a rounded leading edge and tend to work more like a normal wing. Actually, modern wings like the Eurofighter may behave in a sort of intermediate way, flying with an attached flow at low alpha and generating vortices at high alpha, having, well, the best of both worlds. The big advantage of the Delta Wing in the 50s or the 60s was, was connected with speed. The lesson learned from the Korean War was that speed was decisive in air combat. So almost every new design was focused on squeezing all the speed possible. Deltas have a several advantages in this respect. For example, the transonic drag rises more gently and the peak supersonic drag is lower than a conventional design. So passing Mach 1 requires less thrust because it's less shaky. Also, the lift coefficient increases and decreases smoothly with the Mach number with no abrupt variation in the transonic region. The wave drag is reduced because of the high sweep and thin wing sections. The high sweep also means that the wing is inside the main shock wave, avoiding interference that causes extra drag. The large wing root toward, if compared with traditional designs, spreads the lift much more, reducing the associated drag, and makes the application of the area rule relatively simple. The area rule in itself is a complex subject, but you may think that the drag can be reduced, making the fuselage thinner where the wing is thicker. Overall, a delta wing fighter is aerodynamically very clean, allowing quick acceleration and high speed. And this was the reason why it was adopted in quite a large number of designs in the 50s and the 60s. Delta wings also have various other advantages. For example, the stall is mild and happens at a very high angle of attack due to the lifting vortices. The low aspect ratio and high taper allow for a very stiff but light structure with internal room for fuel 
and the under cap. The large wing area produces a low wing loading which fosters maneuverability and handling, particularly at high altitude. Finally, there is a large underwing area for the external store as it appears quite obvious even from modern design. So, if everything was good, why the delta wing configuration did not replace more conventional ones? Well, there are no free lunches, and delta wings also have some rather important drawbacks. The delta wing, while having a low drag, is not very efficient as a lifting body. The lift increases slowly with the angle of attack, and this means that the plane must be flown at a quite high alpha to generate the same lift, and this creates a whole lot of issues. To avoid tail strikes, takeoff and landing speeds are high, airfield performance is poor, and any external load added makes the problem even worse. While the delta wing has a benign behavior at transonic and supersonic speed, at subsonic speed the high angle of attack required to compensate the low lift means that a lot of drag is generated as well. In practice, the pilot ends up with a relatively small range of usable alphas, and he or she has to pay a lot of attention to not increasing it too much and wasting speed and energy. This situation is made even worse by the fact that the trailing edge controls need a constant deflection in flight to maintain the plane stable. This generates a non-negligible, actually rather important, trailing drag, though this is less of a problem with the delta wings with a horizontal tail like the MiG-21. Eh? A delta wing fighter, like every plane, needs to be stable, and the condition for stability is that the center of gravity must be ahead of the aerodynamic center. While in a delta wing, the aerodynamic center doesn't move much with speed and angle of attack, it moves enough to require a complex trimming to compensate the variation of the pitching torque. Uh, planes like the Concorde or the B-58 Hustler uh, got to the point of moving fuel from different tanks to move the center of gravity closer to the aerodynamic center and reduce the necessity of trimming uh, with the elevons. Drag generated in this way was definitely not negligible and particularly at subsonic speed. When in the 60s the focus began shifting from pure speed to ordnance load and airfield performance, the most important advantage of Delta Wing, the, that is supersonic performance, was not so important anymore, and so the solution was slowly abandoned. The season of the variable sweep wing began, but as we're going to see, it was not destined to last long. Yes, because something else was happening at the same time and it was a game changer. In the first half of the 70s, actuators and the theory of control had progressed enough to create control solution where the pilot input was decoupled from the control surfaces. The so-called fly-by-wire was born. Soon after, Computers became fast enough to implement the flight mechanics equations and to be used to control the plane. The pilot no longer just deflected the surfaces, just told the computer the type of maneuver it desired, and the computer commanded the actuators to deflect the surfaces to obtain the required result. This was a radical shift because it gave the designers a freedom that was impossible with conventional commands. The computer could maneuver the plane faster and with more accuracy than any pilot could, and in particular, it was no longer necessary to have a stable design, because the computer could maintain the plane stable by continuously adjusting its trajectory, something that no pilot could do safely. In this new era, it was no longer necessary to keep the center of gravity well ahead of the aerodynamic center to guarantee stability. Planes could be designed with a neutral stability, with the two centers in close proximity. On a conventional wing configuration, this is very useful to improve the handling, but on a delta wing, it also crucially reduces the nasty train drag that we have mentioned before to almost nothing. 
And this is not everything. If the center of gravity is coincident or slightly behind the aerodynamic center, the elevons on the trailing edge need to produce a force directly upward to compensate the torque. This means that the lift of the wing can be lower because it has to compensate just the weight and not only the weight, plus negative lift at the back of the wing. This in turn means that the wing can be flown at angles of attack lower than a stable delta. Finally, computer controlled slats became possible to improve the slope and the lift curve at different uh, conditions, further reducing the need of high angles of attack to generate the lift. As you can see, artificial stability fixed the worst problems of the delta wing configuration, reducing the various additional drag components generated by the need of high angles of attack. Designers all around the world quickly realized this, and in the early 80s, the delta wing made its comeback. The Mirage 2000, for example, demonstrated the minimum speeds of about 100 km per hour, together with maximum speeds of about Mach 2.2. The Eurofighter Typhoon, the Swedish Gripen, the French Rafale, the aborted Israeli Levy, the Indian Tejas, the Chinese J10 and J20, the Sukhoi 57, all of them are Delta designs. So the answer to the initial question of why so many modern fighters use a Delta wing is that artificial stability heavily reduces or thoroughly eliminated the issues of the Delta wing, leaving basically only the advantages. It is not a universal solution yet, and we will see in another video why other configurations still exist but it has become the most optimized aerodynamic configuration that the fighter may have according to our current level of knowledge. Also, you may have noticed that another element has become ubiquitous with the delta wing. These small surfaces here at the front, the canards or four planes. Obviously, there is a reason why they are there, but this will be the subject of the next video. This is the Eurofighter Typhoon. This is the Rafales. This is the Gripen. And this thing is the Chinese data. Did you notice anything? Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. The fighters in the introductions are old generation 4.5 fighters, that is, modern and effective fighters, but not stealthy in configuration. These are the backbone of many air forces in Europe and around the world. I'm sure that you notice that they really look all the same. The general aerodynamic configuration is delta wing with canard planes. We have already discussed how the delta wing became popular in the 50s for its excellent supersonic performance, only to fall out of favor when more versatile planes with larger flight envelopes became necessary. However, the delta wing became the favorite aerodynamic solution in the late 70s and early 80s when the artificial stability resolved many of the problems that used to penalize the delta wing at subsonic speeds. Now we have another question to answer. Why the delta wing is almost always accompanied by four planes, or canards, as the French used to call them? And well, to be honest, it wasn't always the case that Delta wings designed in the 50s did not use four planes, but in few selected cases. The use of canard has become popular only with the modern designs. So let's understand what has changed. Four plans or canards have always been very attractive for designers. Uh, the Wright Brothers flyer had four planes after all. The reason for this on the surface is quite straightforward. 
In a conventional configuration, the center of gravity of the plane must be ahead of the aerodynamic center for stability reasons, so the tail plane must create a downforce to compensate the torque produced by lift and weight. Well, actually, it is more complex than this, with other forces and other torques in play, but yeah, let's leave for the moment. Four planes, on the other hand, need to generate lift to oppose the torque. The lift generated by the foreplane is added to the lift generated by the wing, helping to compensate also the weight, while in a conventional configuration, the wing lift must compensate for the downforce and the weight. Four planes, on the other hand, need to generate lift to oppose the torque. The lift generated by the foreplane is added to the lift generated by the wing, helping to compensate the weight. While in a conventional configuration, the wing alone must compensate for the weight and the downforce. However, as usual, there are no free lunches and canards have also drawbacks that prevented their generalized adoption. The first point is that four planes are not inherently stable while the classic configuration is. In general, aerodynamic surfaces placed behind the center of gravity of a plane or a missile are stabilizing. Planes placed ahead of it are destabilizing. To make a canard plane stable, the center of gravity must be brought well forward so that the main wind becomes de facto the stabilizing force. But if you bring the center of gravity forward, more weight will rest on the canards, which will need to be large or fly at higher angle of attack to balance it. In this case, the foreplane drag will be high, particularly at supersonic speed, cancelling part of the advantage. The second important drawback is that the canards generate their own aerodynamic field, which has an effect on the main wind. The canard downwash invests the main wing reducing the angle of attack at which it is flying. The wing itself will not be able to use all of its capability to generate lift, again negating part of the advantages of the canard configuration. These drawbacks made canards quite rare in the past since the advantages were not as massive as it could be expected by a superficial analysis. They were used in particular cases like for the XB-70 Valkyrie, where their purpose was basically just to help the rotation of the plane at takeoff. However, with the Delta Wing, canards were also promising some advantages that the designer were eager to grasp. The Delta Wing works in a different way if compared to with a traditional wing. It generates a lift by a system of vortices that suck the wing upward. Again, if you are interested in a detailed discussion, there is an entire video about it. So, maintaining the wing vortices stable and strong is essential to preserve the aerodynamic quality of the delta wing. If the four planes are themselves a delta wing, experiments show how the vortices from the wing and the four plane interact positively, stabilizing each other. However, unfortunately, when this happens, we fall back into the downwash problem, having a stable wing with well-developed vortices that generates just part of the lift it could without the four planes. So a solution had to be found and it came from an unsuspected direction. In the first half of the 70s, actuators and the theory of control had progressive enough to create control solutions where the pilot input was decoupled from the control surfaces. This was the so-called fly-by-wire. Soon after, computers became fast enough to implement the flight mechanics equations and to be used uh, to control the plane. The pilot no longer deflected the surfaces, it just told the computer the type of maneuver it desired, and the computer commanded the actuators to deflect the surfaces to obtain the required result. Uh, this was a radical revolution because it gave the designers a freedom that was impossible with conventional commands. And in particular, it was no longer necessary to have a stable design because the computer 
could maintain the plane stable by continuously adjusting its trajectory, and this was something that no pilot could do safely. So, in this new era, it was no longer necessary to keep the center of gravity while well I have the aerodynamic center to guarantee stability, basically trusting the computer for the rest. In particular, if the plane could be designed with a neutral stability with the center of gravity roughly uh, placed together with the uh, aerodynamic center of the wing, little or no weight needs to be loaded onto the canard, which can operate mostly at the point of minimal drag. At transonic and supersonic speed, the aerodynamic center of the wing shifts a bit backwards, the four planes need to lift a bit to compensate, and in that configuration, the lift to drag ratio is better than in a plane with a conventional configuration. Since modern fighters operate at transonic or low supersonic speed, the best performance of the Delta Plus Canard configuration happens to be exactly in the sweet spot, where it is most needed. This is the reason why today, for fighters in high-performance planes, the Delta Plus Canard configuration is the most used. If stealth is not your primary consideration, the Delta Plus Canard is the winning configuration. It is not the only possible, but is by far the most used. Okay, job done, you may think, but, well, we are not done yet. Some of you are the most familiar with this type of engineering problems may be thinking, but if you can maintain the stability with a computer and the four planes generate very little lift, why do I need them at all? Aren't the wing elevons enough? Yes, they are, you are right, a delta wing can be artificially stabilized with the elevons, but there are other advantages connected with the use of four planes if you don't have to put too much weight on them to keep the planes right. The canards may improve the lateral stability, they reduce the sensitivity to the gust, they have lower supersonic drag than a conventional tail design, but most of all they offer a possibility which is way less easily used by fighters with a relaxed stability but a conventional configuration. Delta canards are ideal to implement direct force maneuvering. A conventional fighter maneuvers by vectoring the lift, rotating the plane around the center of gravity by the use of the aerodynamic forces generated by the control surfaces. So, to turn a plane first roll, then pitches, then yaws, and then does the same to go back level flight. With direct force maneuvering, the plane may do without of some of these movements, or it can just move in an unexpected way, which may be an advantage in air combat. Activating the flap and having the four planes lift suddenly at the same time increases the lift, making the plane jump up in the air. The position of the two lift points, while well forward and aft of the center of gravity, allows a better control of the torque than in a conventional configuration plane. That would if it tries to do the same, a plane with a conventional tail will probably just point the nose down, and that would be it. The same can be done in conjunction with the increase of the angle of attack, which is useful to bleed energy to avoid overshooting in a dogfight. And finally, moving the rudder and the four planes differentially can generate a net lateral force that moves the plane sideways without changing direction. All these are maneuvers that would never be possible without the help of a computer in the middle between the pilot and the airplane control surfaces, and if the control surfaces weren't far from the center of gravity. Okay, job done, you may think, but no, there's still one rather important advantage of having unloaded canards. Do you remember when we mentioned that the vortices from the canard and the wing would interact positively if only the downwash problem was not there? Well, modern configurations do not use a delta wing as the foreplane, so the canard only produces weaker 
wingtip vortices still useful, but they behave differently. If the canard bears little or no load, it also doesn't produce the penalizing downwash on the wing. The canard position is often close coupled that is very close to the leading edge, which is beneficial to the flow on the inner section of the wing. This is another reason why this configuration is so popular today. The Delta Wing Plus Canards has become the most common aerodynamic formula for the high performance fighters designed from the 80s onwards. The European triad of Rafale, Eurofighter and Gripen is the living demonstration. However, it is not universal and there is a reason for that. So in the 80s, the introduction of relaxed artificial stability has allowed designers to overcome the main problems of the Delta Wing. The Delta Wing had always performed very well at supersonic speeds, but it was difficult to fly and not very efficient at subsonic speed. The problem at subsonic speed is that the high trim drag required to keep the plane in equilibrium. With the relaxed stability, the trim drag drops to zero and almost, and the overall efficiency in terms of lift to drag ratio is better, up to 20% better 20%, than an equivalent conventional configuration. The introduction of canards also allowed to improve the handling and the overall aerodynamic performance, allowing for maneuvers quite difficult to execute with a conventional configuration. So, with good performances in the whole speed envelope, excellent maneuverability, and a number of other practical advantages, the Delta configuration has become the most popular because of its actual superiority upon the conventional configuration with a tail. So, if Delta Canard is so good, why it is not universal? Why there are modern planes with relaxed stability that still have a conventional configuration? Well, obviously, there is a reason. Well, the simplest and most obvious reason is its stealth. The shape of stealth fighter is dictated by the necessity of reducing the rate of cross-section and controlled diffusion effects. Stealth fighters are not designed to be excellent from an aerodynamic point of view, and in general, they can't be. They will always be the result of a compromise between aerodynamics and stealthiness. Yes, I know, the F-22 to achieve its performance actually requires two of the best jet engines ever built and a lot of thrust. Uh, while the Delta Wing itself could not be too bad, and in fact the Russian used it on the Sukhoi 57s in terms of stealth, the canards are a big no-no if you want a stealth fighter. <sighs> they just create a powerful reflector. In fact, the Chinese J-20 has four planes, but they are a good reason to doubt about its stealthiness, at least from some angles. The F-16 and F-18 have a relaxed artificial stability, but also have a traditional configuration. Since it was the key factor that made the Delta Wing better on high-performance fighters, it would be expected that both planes might have ended up adopting it. Well, to be honest, they sort of did. Those projects started before European fighters, so the studies on the impact of artificial relaxed stability on the Delta Wing were not as advanced at the time, but the high alpha lift produced by the Delta Wing was, in fact, well known. F-16 and F-18 have an aerodynamic solution called LURKS, the acronym for Leading Edge Root Extension. There are aerodynamic surfaces standing forward from the leading edge near the wing root blend into the fuselage. Their purpose is to generate two vortices at high angle of attack, which produce some extra lift that allows the plane to fly and maneuver when the main wing is near or beyond the stall. This is very, very useful to point the nose of the plane and its weapons in the direction of a potential enemy. Now, if you look at the lurks from above, it becomes clear what they actually are. They are a small delta wing placed before the conventional wing. So, even if the overall configuration is conventional, they make use of one of the advantages of the delta wing.
And what about the Russians? Well, the Sukhoi 27 and MiG-29 families still have a conventional configuration. Again, they started to be designed a bit before the European fighters, but still they are extremely advanced planes from an aerodynamic point of view. The path that the Russians followed was different from than that of the Western planes. The Sukhoi 27 and MiG-29 families do not have a well-defined fuselage, which the wing is attached to. They are lifting bodies, where different shapes blend together to provide a seamless performance in the largest possible flight envelope. The Sukhoi 27 family has three pods attached to a central section, whose platform is sort of a delta in the forward section and square toward the tail, uh, complemented by conventional thin profile wings outboard. The combination and complexity of this solution allows the outstanding high alpha and postal performance exhibited by this plane. So, while a proper delta wing is not used, the vortex generation idea is used by this plane. Mm. And what about the Chinese? Well, they copied with equal enthusiasm American, European, and the Russian solutions. So, well, kudos for keeping an open mind, I suppose. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you did, I'm sure you will enjoy these other videos here beside me. So, and uh, please like, dislike, subscribe, and smash the bell if you want to support the channel. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.